The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Nora Godwin The Case of the Jaws of Doom Narrated by Peter Silverleaf It was late May when Sherlock Holmes and I were asked to join an investigation that had taken place in a small seaside town in southern England. The name is of no importance here, and out of respect for those involved and affected, I will also use the one or other pseudonym with the people involved. We arrived in the early afternoon by train from London, in a quiet, tranquil little town, but one that had been the scene of an exceedingly brutal crime. The local police inspector, Mr. Robert Summers, personally picked us up from the station. He was a small, somewhat overweight, middle-aged man whose hairline was already receding. The moustache, however, had not yet turned grey. Our colleague made no secret of the fact that he expected considerable assistance from our arrival. "'I'm very grateful that you are heeding my request,' he assured. "'You have to know, uh, there's usually no major crime here. Uh, this is a quiet town with decent people.' Uh, "'So does this mean,' I replied, uh, "'that you suspect an out-of-town perpetrator?' The inspector shook his head. No, Dr. Watson, I simply cannot be certain of that, but I confess that I do hope so. The origin of the person responsible will not matter, Holmes announced, unmoved. Either way, we will convict him and bring him to justice. After all, two murders within a few days is not a minor incident. I guess you could say that, Inspector Summers confirmed. In this respect, time is of the essence— Am I correct in assuming that you want to inspect the bodies first? I'd love to. It slipped out of my mouth inappropriately, and I quickly corrected myself. I mean, uh, this will clearly be necessary at first. Uh, the victims are in the basement of the police building, the inspector explained, or at least what is left of them. They were brutalized. I gave Holmes a doubtful look but my friend responded with an expression that seemed to imply a sort of macabre, but in reality probably emphasised a sense of forensic anticipation. We marched on foot through the streets of the city, and I noticed that renovation and construction work was going on everywhere. I brought this up to Inspector Summers. Uh, the city is preparing for the summer season, the inspector informed. Our mayor has big plans— the town is to become a modern seaside resort and health retreat, in competition, so to speak, uh, with Brighton or Eastbourne. Solvent guests are expected from the ranks of better society, if you know what I mean. I understood the intention, but it seemed to me to be a very ambitious plan. They had already built a large hotel and renovated the pier, but it still appeared more like a second Blackpool that was being built here. The place was not sophisticated enough for aristocracy, and moneyed aristocracy, they would probably rather attract summer visitors from middle classes and the working class, but that was not my concern. I understand, I merely said as we continued on our way. The police station, which we reached after about fifteen minutes, was only a small building. In this respect, we were not surprised that the inspector was assisted by only one fellow uniformed officer named Mr. Winters. Mr. Winters was a young, tall, strong man with red hair. We did not dwell long on greetings and introductions, and went straight to the basement, where the bodies of the murder victims rested on two pathology tables under white sheets. When Inspector Summers pulled them back one by one, I was downright shocked for a few seconds. The corpses were horribly mutilated. The bodies had been literally massacred. 
Of one corpse, only a torso was left. The other one at least still had remnants of leg stumps. Overall, we were looking at blood-encrusted carcasses. Some of the flesh had been torn to the bone. Whoever had done this was a paragon of cruelty and downright diabolical inhumanity. Not a pretty sight, is it? the inspector stated. Any attempt to identify the victims is futile. There is no basis for that. Holmes circled the table and said, Certainly, at first glance there is little to see here except for the fact that a brutal butcher was at work. However, as far as the identification of the dead is concerned, allow me to raise the question. Is there anyone in town known to be missing? No, no one, Summers replied. Therefore, I assume that the individuals are not local. Very well, Watson, Holmes prompted me. Go ahead and work your magic. I frowned and alternately eyed the two corpses. From a forensic point of view, ad hoc, I can say the following, I explained. The cause of death is most likely loss of blood to match, uh, given the massive injuries. Uh, frankly, uh, the removal of extremities may also cause immediate death. Uh, in addition, it seems as if someone had used a cleaver or large knives to mutilate the bodies, although the exact sequence of the mutilations can no longer be determined. Both remains are likely to be of males. Holmes nodded at me and said, Thank you. Uh, we've seen enough for now. You can do a more thorough examination later. Then he turned to Inspector Summers. Uh, the victims were found on the beach, I gather? Uh, that is correct, the inspector confirmed. Uh, you want to see the location, I take it? Of course, Holmes replied. Perhaps the area surrounding the crime is a little more telling than the victims are. Once again, on foot, we headed for the coast. It was a luminous and small sandy beach that Summers presented to us as the site where the dead were found. They had been located in relative proximity to each other. One was found yesterday, the other two days ago. As far as I am concerned, there was hardly anything that would have provided useful information about the crime. It was people out walking who found the bodies in both cases, the inspector explained, pointing out the exact locations. At the point in time was quite early in the morning in each case. I came here immediately after being notified to secure the area. Unfortunately, I must confess that no indications were and are apparent to me as to how this atrocity took place. Holmes got down on his knees and picked up some sand, and with his right hand letting it drizzle and trickle back to the ground. And then he looked around. Observing the rolling waves of the sea, the fishing boats, as well as the excursion steamers that cruised off the coast with their leisure travellers. Finally, he rose again and stated, Clearly there are no traces of the crime here, because this is not the scene of the crime. The two victims did not die on the beach, but at sea. Either they were thrown into the water from a ship, or they were already in it. At any rate, the tide washed the lifeless bodies up here. When the sea pulled back, the bodies were left on the beach. Inspector Summers briefly reflected, coming to the conclusion, mm, That's quite feasible. Uh, but how do you figure that? Holmes smiled kindly and explained, When comparing the tidal limits, uh, that can be traced in the colour and moisture content of the sand with the sites where the bodies were found, uh, this same overlap exists. However, I must add that I had the suspicion before, because just behind the embankment are houses and roads. If a massacre had taken place here on the beach, where the victims were slaughtered in such a way, uh, there ought to be witnesses from the neighbourhood. However, uh, this is not the case. In this respect, the conclusion was an a priori uh, that the murders were carried out elsewhere, in a more secluded location. Uh, once Dr. Watson takes a closer look at the bodies, I'm sure he'll find evidence that they've been floating in seawater for some time. My friend was right. 
but the prospect of that was not pleasant. It would require careful dissection of the remains by every trick in the book to make sure. So we returned to the police station to get to work. In the basement, I picked up a scalpel and pliers to helplessly poke around the sad remains of the carcasses for a bit at first. To buy time, I commented on my actions while Holmes and Inspector Summers stood behind me, looking over my shoulder in anticipation. Uh, there is little out of the ordinary here, except, of course, the horrible overall condition of the bodies, I quickly claimed. Uh, the skin was cut with sharp instruments, and uh, most of the internal organs were destroyed. I should be quite surprised if— I backed away, startled in an instant. You've got to be kidding, I called out, glancing at Holmes, distressed. Uh, there's something moving on the inside of the cadaver. My friend approached me, unimpressed, and took the pliers from my hand to get to the root of the mystery. He pushed aside the already exposed pancreas, whereupon we found ourselves in for another surprise. Four, five, six small crabs climbed out of the corpse. Holmes captured one with the pincers and presented the sea creature. There you go, gentlemen. Here's our proof. Odontodactylus scilaris, the Atlantic mantis shrimp. Unlike, say, the shore crab, this species is found only in water, which means that our friendly little scavenger has not taken up residence in the body after it has been washed ashore. That means this man, uh, probably like his comrade, died at sea before the waves carried him to land. I tried shaking off images of crabs eating away on innards, while the inspector carried on the thoughts. If that is true, he said, then this case may not even be in my jurisdiction. The murders could have happened anywhere. They might as well have happened off the coast of France. But Holmes shook his head. Unlikely, he stated with certainty as he placed the shrimp back into the corpse, much to my horror. The currents of the canal do not permit this type of large stretch. Moreover, had our victims originated in France, they would have sunk to the bottom en route, and they would also have been in worse condition. In worse condition? I repeated, irritated. What could possibly be worse? My friend handed me back the pliers and replied, Not in a physical sense, my dear Watson. Uh, but the salt water would have affected the tissue more than it appears to be the case in a long-term chemical process. And now, please resume your work. I complied with the request, but proceeded now to the other corpse. Are we looking for anything in particular? I asked. Something specific, perhaps? Certainly, Holmes replied. We need clues as to the cause of death and the identities of the victims, otherwise we'll be none the wiser. Nodding my head, I went back to work, extremely carefully, because I didn't want to startle any creatures again. The second corpse showed essentially the same pattern. Heavily destroyed organs and, on closer inspection, remarkably razor-sharp cuts. I'm still uncertain, I commented, if there was a butcher or a surgeon at work here. According to my experience, the difference is small joked the inspector in the background, but I decided to ignore this provocative statement against the medical profession. At the same time, I noticed that I was dissecting the body as if I was filleting a slaughtered animal. But then I made a new discovery. Two alien objects were found, not too large, triangular, pointed and hard, which were certainly not human bone splinters. I removed one of them and showed it to the others. Look, gentlemen, I said, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is a tooth, a fang, to be exact. A fang? stammered Summers shakily. You suppose as in a predator's tooth? Indeed, I confirmed immediately and allowed myself to slip into a quick conclusion. Do you have any idea what that means? We presumably got two answers at once with one clue regarding both the cause of death and the perpetrator. Do you know the perpetrator? The inspector inquired. Well, not personally, 
I replied confidently, but I am now aware of his species. Summers finally made an entirely puzzled face. What do you mean, Dr. Watson? I took a deep breath and cleared my throat to increase the tension, then announced, These two men were not killed by their own kind. The murderer is not human. It was a shark. A shark? the inspector repeated. Are you sure about that? Certainly, I replied. There's no doubt. This tooth comes from the fatal bite of a shark. It must have fallen out and gotten stuck in the flesh as the beast attacked and mauled the victims. Uh, furthermore, a shark attack also explains the disastrous condition of the corpses as well as the missing limbs, which are likely to be in the creature's stomach by now. Holmes had taken quiet notice of my remarks and only now became involved again. My dear Watson, you do realize that we are not dealing with a trashy wildlife horror story here, don't you? Shark attacks are extremely rare, especially in marine areas that have been well cultivated by man. And yet they do occur, I countered. Food shortages and population densities can lead predators to seek out new food sources. There are known cases where a, a great white shark has literally besieged individual sections of the coast. I have read about related incidents around a small island off the U.S. east coast, and the waters off Australia are likely to be shark-infested so much so uh, that it is better not to go into the water at all. One swimmer may be lost without salvation in an attack, but even small boats have been capsized. These are exotic places you're talking about, Holmes said, still not convinced. We are here on the English Channel, a busy shipping route with fisheries and seaside resorts. So, uh, with sufficient food supply for a killer shark, I added, the facts don't lie. Uh, just look at the condition of the bodies, and then imagine an animal superior in water having hundreds of such teeth in several rows, snapping with exceedingly powerful jaws, crushing everything. With these words, I handed Holmes the shark tooth as proof. My friend examined the tooth for a few seconds, then confirmed, like hundreds of sharp and pointed blades, in fact, as if made for bloody carnage. You believe me? I inquired. I think we have a solid theory here, Holmes stated to my satisfaction. Nice work, Watson. Can you also tell us, then, what species of shark we're talking about? I shook my head. Forgive me, Holmes. I'm a physician, not an ichthyologist. Uh, but there is no doubt whatsoever that this is a shark tooth. Now Inspector Summers also spoke up again. Uh, but what does that mean for the case, if it's still one? Uh, surely I can't arrest a shark. No, surely not, I replied. But then the same thing applies to other crimes. A dangerous murderer who is up to his worst must be taken out of the streets or the waters. Uh, you have to take down the shark or this stretch of coastline won't be safe. Hardly the best conditions to establish an attractive seaside resort. Summers was blindsided, because now he realized the full scope of the matter. You're absolutely right, he exclaimed excitedly. We need to inform the mayor immediately. Come along, gentlemen. You go ahead, said Holmes. Dr. Watson will be joining you to present the forensic and scientific findings to the mayor. I will take care of other business in the meantime. You do have a phone line here, don't you? Oh, yes, of course assured the inspector. It is at your disposal. Who are you trying to contact, if you don't mind me asking? Well, if we have to handle a ferocious shark, Holmes explained, we need professional help. I will ask Dr. Quint Hooper of the Oceanographic Institute in Southampton, for instance. So Summers and I left Holmes to go to see the mayor, whom we will be calling Mr. Hamilton for the sake of confidentiality. The elderly gentleman with grey hair and smoothly shaved cheeks looked a little stressed, and it was to be feared that our message would amplify his predicament. When we entered his office, he urged us to hasten. 
Uh, come on, gentlemen, I'm very busy, as you know. Uh, by the time the tourist season starts, everything here in the city has to be spotless and immaculate. Uh, so, Inspector, how is your investigation going? Uh, finding a corpse is not exactly adorning a place of recreation and amusement, either. Uh, the sooner the dead are put underground, the better. Of course, Mr. Hamilton, Summers began. As a matter of fact, we've already made some progress, uh, thanks to the assistance I've requested from London. Oh, yes, the consulting detective, Hamilton commented, addressing me. Uh, you must be this famous Gerald Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, I corrected. Uh, why, of course, I already said that, the mayor claimed. Well, actually, I'm a physician, I tried to clarify, and merely the colleague of... "'Don't bother with details,' Mr. Hamilton interrupted me immediately. "'Stick to the facts only, please. What are your findings?' Uh, "'Then I will be brief,' I declared. Uh, "'The two dead were killed by a shark.' The mayor started to laugh, then eyed me suspiciously. "'So what are you, then? A detective, a physician, or a... Comedian, after all. There are no sharks here. With that, he looked over to the inspector and asked him, What's this about, Summers? I don't have time for that kind of nonsense. My local investigator colleague hesitated, and then struggled to explain. It's true, sir. Everything indicates that a dangerous shark is lurking off the coast. He already killed two people and may attack others. We need to take security measures immediately. I think you should close off the beaches and ban swimming. You are out of your mind, exclaimed Mr. Hamilton. Do you want to ruin this town? We have invested a lot of money to get everything ready for our paying visitors. Delaying the start of the season would result in significant financial losses. We can't afford to do that. Uh, then there will be more victims and more deaths, I interjected. Can you afford that? Nonsense, replied the mayor in a gruff manner. Those are just figments of your imagination. A killer shark in the canal? How absurd! Do you have any evidence for this hogwash? Uh, we do, Inspector Summers replied. One of the bodies still had broken shark teeth in it. Teeth? repeated Mayor Hamilton. May I see them? Yes, actually, I mean, no, the inspector stammered. Not at this moment. Uh, we don't happen to have them with us. Are you kidding me? The mayor scoffed. Uh, listen, Summers, I will not order any restrictions just because of your bizarre and adventurous claims. End of story. Come back when you have some real findings to show for your investigation. Until then, leave me alone. I carry great responsibility and have no need for your sabotage. I also have no need for know-it-alls from London, by the way. Uh, shouldn't we at least initiate some minimal safety precautions? The inspector suggested nonetheless. After all, there is some risk. You're a risk, yelled Mayor Hamilton at his police chief. To be exact, for the economic fresh start of our town. But if it makes you happy, you can then go ahead and post up on the beach and look for shark fins. Perhaps you have more talent as a lifeguard. I'm starting to doubt your ability as a policeman. Now, I kindly ask you both to get out of my sight. Good day. Initially, Summers kept silent as he made his way back to the police station. The conversation with the mayor certainly did not go well because he did not believe our theory. Finally, I came up with the idea of taking matters into my own hands. Do you have a boat? I asked abruptly. For the love of God, no, the inspector replied. I don't like boats. To be specific, I hate the sea. It's dark and perilous. I had to laugh. But you do live on the coast, I said. Either way, on land, Summers replied. Normally, leaving terra firma is not necessary, even in terms of work. What do you want with a boat, anyway? I have a very uneasy suspicion, Dr. Watson. I can affirm that, I interrupted the inspector. We have to render the shark harmless on our own. 
We need to find and hunt it down. It was obvious that Summers was less than enthusiastic about this prospect. Still, he said, My fellow Winters has a boat. Do you really want to go out to sea to chase the shark? We don't have any other choice, I stated resolutely. But we will not embark on this alone. We need help, as Holmes said, the right equipment, bait and harpoons, and most importantly, an experienced fisherman who knows how to shark hunt. My brother-in-law is a harpooner on a whaler, the inspector explained. Unfortunately, he is not available. He is likely to be somewhere off the coasts of Greenland these days. In the meantime, we arrived at the police building. Before we entered, I said, Maybe Holmes had better luck. Dr. Hooper is an expert on the subject of sharks. My hope was not to be fulfilled. Dr. Hooper is on an expedition in the South Seas, Holmes reported. His colleague who gave me this information couldn't really help me. Apparently his speciality is squids and octopuses. In any case, he thinks it unlikely that a killer shark is up to snuff off the south coast of England. Then he is in line with the mayor, I stated, a wholly non-compliant guy who only has the financial gain from the vacation season in mind. He thinks we're idiots who cling to some crazy theory. I see, Holmes replied. Well, I guess you can't blame him for being concerned about the financial well-being of his town, nor can you blame him for not believing a hypothesis that is only vaguely backed up. But you believe in it, I insinuated, and saw in Holmes's expression that this was only partly the case. Uh, that is not what I said, he clarified. I merely conceded that your theory was sound. It is far from verified. My patience, however, was not so sound. What are we supposed to wait for? I whined. Do we need more mutilated victims? No, we have to do what we always do. Turn in the killer and put a stop to it. Even if it's a fish, suggested Holmes somewhat flippantly. A killer fish, I immediately corrected. Yes, even if it's a fish, to the harpoons. Holmes tilted his head slightly, which inevitably meant that a lecture would ensue. You have zeal, courage and honour, my dear Watson, began my friend. But it will not be necessary for us to become acquainted with deep-sea fishing. We're detectives, not shark hunters. If I have to be, I will become one. I growled defiantly. There is no need for it, Holmes continued. Little by little, I understood what he was actually trying to tell me. No way, Holmes, I cried. You solved the case in the meantime, didn't you? When were you going to share this with me? And I guess I'm right in thinking that this crime has nothing to do with sharks after all. At least not in terms of perpetrators. Holmes confirmed, and I could tell he was at least a little sorry. And nevertheless, I can acknowledge that the tooth you found was the key to solving this case. Very comforting, I noted, but I still can't quite follow you on that one. Of course not, Holmes continued. When you pulled the shark tooth out of the carcass, it was very dirty. I took the liberty of cleaning it thoroughly and made an interesting discovery. It features indentations and discoloration. These are not of natural origin. In other words, someone has worked on the tooth in an artistic way, if you will, although at the level of a not overly advanced culture. In short, the shark tooth is a piece of jewellery, so this implies human utilisation. But see for yourself. Holmes handed me the tooth so that I could see for myself that he was right. The tooth showed carved and painted ornaments that I had not seen prior because of the dirt and encrustations on it. It also means, Holmes added, that the tooth did not, of course, break out of a shark's jaw when it bit into a human body, but that the victim had been carrying the piece of jewellery when he was massacred, and in the process it probably came loose from a necklace or something and got caught between the exposed intestines where you eventually found it. Thus, it is further noted that in the event 
and the presence of a shark is not to be confirmed. Acquittal for the shark, I commented resignedly, handing the tooth back to Holmes. I regret my hasty conclusion and apologize for it. Also to you, Inspector Summers, because I put you in a difficult position in front of the mayor. Do not hesitate to lay all the blame on me in front of him. I deserve it. The policeman shook his head. Don't worry, Dr. Watson. I can stand my ground in front of Mr. Hamilton. He'll be mostly glad that there really isn't a killer shark, and will soon forget about it. And, as an investigator myself, I know all too well that the first lead, however compelling it may seem, is not always the right one in terms of solving a case. Uh, but what is the solution now? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute, promised Holmes, who was now free to resume his lecture. First, we want to address the identity of the victims. You know who the deceased are? asked Summers. My friend denied. Unfortunately not. Uh, but I know where they're from. Uh, the shark tooth, as well as the call to Dr. Hooper, was the key to this. I thought you didn't reach him, I interjected. Uh, that's right, Holmes agreed, because after all, he's on a ship in the South Pacific. However, uh, this fact indirectly put me on the right track, uh, since I remembered where I had seen such similar jewellery as our shark tooth before. At the British Museum in London. I don't suppose, I said jokingly, that our victims are English museum employees. Holmes smiled. Of course not, he confirmed. I know such jewellery from an ethnological exhibition in the British Museum. Uh, this involved the indigenous tribes of Polynesia, Micronesia and Melanesia, the islands of the Pacific South Seas. Our shark tooth also originated there, and it resembles the exhibits back then with great precision. I knew my role in my friend's remarks, and therefore I asked the right question. Uh, thus, it was also reasonable to suspect that the victims were Polynesian, was it not? Indeed, my dear Watson, Holmes replied. Admittedly, I still had to verify this. Therefore, I took the liberty of interfering with your forensic work during your absence and to examine the bodies once again. One must add, it gets easier when you know what you're looking for. What were you looking for? Summers wanted to know. You better ask him what he found, I murmured to the inspector. Holmes remained unperturbed and kept at it. It took evidence of Polynesian ancestry to support my theory, he continued. Given the horrific mutilation of the cadavers, uh, this was somewhat of a challenge, uh, but both bodies still had areas of intact skin. In turn, uh, they finally provided me with proof, namely in the form of traditional tattoo patterns as they are common in the South Seas. Uh, the dead are, in fact, Polynesians. Remarkable. Summers attested. These are conclusive and striking findings, and you didn't even have to leave the police station in the process to conclude. Don't praise him too soon, I warned the inspector. I believe there are still a few questions left unanswered. What were the two men doing out here, thousands of nautical miles from their home? And above all, how did they get killed? One thing at a time, my dear Watson— my friend urged me. I must confess that the following explanations are preliminary assumptions that would still have to be confirmed, if this is at all desired by the police. I assume that the two men were immigrants. They wanted to leave behind their meagre lives on their deserted islands and try their fortune in England. What a tragedy that this hopeful venture failed so close to shore and had to end with their deaths, because their boat sank. If they were immigrants— I asked. Why didn't they just hire themselves out on one of the frequent merchant ships to get here? This is a safe option and is open to all of Her Majesty's subjects. But they weren't, Holmes explained. These men were from French Polynesia, so they only came to France by ship. However, they wanted to go to England, which had to appear to them as the rich centre of the world and the land of endless opportunities. Uh, but they had to enter the British Isles as illegal immigrants. Any other entry would have resulted in only a limited residence permit. Uh, therefore, uh, they purchased a small boat on the opposite coast in France and secretly used it to cross to England. If we were to make inquiries in the French port nearest to this city, I am sure we could find the man who sold a boat to two Polynesians a few days ago. 
but they never arrived in England, I noted. At least not alive. Quite so, Holmes continued. Their boat may have been just too small to be suitable for crossing the channel. Then again, they probably didn't know that. Or it was already damaged in the first place. It is also conceivable that there was some misfortune, such as a collision with a larger ship, for undoubtedly the Polynesians undertook their voyage under the supposed protection of the Dark Knight. But this is speculation and hardly to be resolved. Neither is the question of whether the men drowned or died of injuries. Well, the bodies do have injuries, I added, and significant ones, to put it mildly. The bodies were almost torn apart and terribly mutilated. From a medical perspective, this is a perfectly plausible cause of death. Certainly, Holmes agreed. But these mutilations could have occurred post-mortem. So it was by sea creatures after all, I surmised. Holmes shook his head. That's unlikely. Only small fish and crabs nibble a carcass, but this is not likely to cause such severe trauma. A shark, on the other hand, which would theoretically be capable of such a thing, is more interested in living prey. Therefore, I assume that it was the most dangerous creature on the planet that did such damage to our victims. Whether before or after they died, I don't know, but in any case, it was an accident. What horrible accident could cause that? exclaimed Summers. A ship's propeller or a paddle wheel, Holmes replied. Either the Polynesians had already drowned and were floating lifeless in the sea when they got caught in a turbine, or it was the collision with a paddle steamer that first capsized their boat, after which they were caught by the powerful blades. I must confess, I hope the poor men did not end up having their bodies torn apart while they were still alive. Drowning seems to me to be the more humane way of the two to die, be that as it may. Subsequently, the mutilated bodies at different times washed up on the shore of this city where they were found. That's it, gentlemen. As far as I am concerned, the case is closed, although the details would still have to be looked into, if this is wanted on the one hand and possible at all on the other. The victims can be buried. The tragedy of the events as described by Holmes made me quickly forget the frustration about being on the wrong track of a shark attack. I was devastated and also somewhat at a loss as to what to make of it. On the train ride back to London there was hardly any talking, and I used the time to reflect. Two men had died in search of a better life. We know nothing about them and will not learn anything. Did they want to make a fresh start and build up a new livelihood in England? or was it their intention to work up a modest amount of wealth to return home and support their families? Their relatives and friends in Polynesia would never know what had happened to them, and how meaningless it is that the two victims died because they wanted, or needed, to enter the United Kingdom as illegal immigrants. How can a person be illegal? Life goes on in the upcoming seaside resort and health spa of anonymous name on the English South Coast. Business will be booming, guests will be courted, and pleasure steamers will be cruising near the coast with solvent passengers. No one would notice if, perhaps again, a small refugee boat was caught in paddles, if people drowned or were killed by a ship's propeller. No one will take notice that two more nameless graves have been added to the seamen's cemetery, where the sad remains of two hopeful young men from Polynesia were buried. Even if it was an accident on the surface, below they were mauled by the deadly jaws of the human predator.